Hello, hello, and it is sadly hello for the final time, at least sort of, as this is it, the grand finale episode of Not Your Mother's Goose. I'm Topher Goggin, and 50 shows ago, we hit record for a sarcastic take on Jack and the Beanstalk, and somehow we're just now wrapping up two and a half years later. Remember that the show will live on via YouTube, including some new material along with classic segments, so make sure to subscribe at youtube.com slash the at sign, so at not your mother's goose. But for now, that's enough nostalgia. The question is, what's still left lying around in the digital file cabinet for this last show? It's kind of like when you're listening to one of those countdowns of people's hundred favorite Beatles songs, and you realize that they still haven't played Hey Bulldog, even though you're in the top 20. But here's what we have. Coming up today, we'll chop off some tails with the three blind mice, corner the spouse storage market with Peter Peter Pumpkin Eater, try one more movie before and after, and make ourselves merry with Old King Cole. We've also got a final dose of news, sponsorship from uh, Progressive, don't worry, it's not Flow, and a production from Andrew Mitchell on Rapunzel's Jukebox that you simply have to hear. I will not be offended if you skip the rest of the show right now and go to the end to listen to his version of American Pie. I really wasn't sure whether this was even going to work. Now I think it's one of the most amazing things he has ever done. Anyhow, that is what's coming, but you're not here for poetic waxing. You're here to laugh, so let's go. Up first, set your clocks for 11 a.m. and flip over to CBS. We're opening things up today with The Price is Right. The Price is Right. In theory, Not Your Mother's Goose is supposed to be about the stories of our childhood, a definition that I will admit has expanded a bit over time, mainly so I wouldn't have to write any more Aladdin jokes. But you know what was definitely a part of your childhood? The Price is Right. You got sick, stayed home from school. What did you do? You watched the genie of prizes, Bob Barker. And let's be clear, with all due respect to Drew Carey, who has definitely grown on me over the years, The Price is Right is Bob Barker's world. Not only did the man make every eight-foot putt he tried, but he stared death in the face daily, mainly in the form of the risks of being hugged, manhandled, or just plain bulldozed by every single excitable contestant, male or female, that made it up on his stage, especially if that person was over the age of 80. And that, of course, is the charm of The Price is Right. This is the game you could play. You're not beating Ken Jennings in trivia on Jeopardy. Nobody's calling you for American Idol. Your spelling skills are a little too strong for the perplexing answers you see on Wheel of Fortune. But guessing the price of a box of stovetop stuffing and dropping Plinko chips, that could be your wheelhouse. I grew up on The Price is Right, and I say this with a great degree of false humility. I could have crushed any five-year-old in America on that show. I watched with my grandma every day before afternoon kindergarten, and we knew that the Pin Seeker Golf Clubs cost exactly $1,001, and that somebody was going to bid 1000 and then the next person was going to bid 1001 and then the bell was going to ring for a perfect bid every single time. Now, ironically, I actually wrote this a few months ago, and I recently have been watching some of these old Barker-era shows on Pluto TV, and on the episodes I've seen, the golf clubs cost $1,021. This is calling all of my childhood memories into question. But anyway, let's take a quick run through a Price is Right episode. We start with a studio full of insane people yelling and screaming as an announcer riles them up even more. This could be Rich Fields, Johnny Olson if you're old school, but it's really got to be Rod Roddy, doesn't it? Fresh from his days on Press Your Luck, Rod was what you would get if you asked John Madden to steal a jacket from a 1970s circus ringmaster and then tell you all about Polydent. Rod tells four people to come on down, they react in a way that makes the winner of the last Mega Millions jackpot seem subdued, and we're off and running. Up next, we'll have an item up for bids, where the four lucky contestants will take turns guessing the price of a lawnmower, while demonstrating a mastery of game theory that makes you wonder if they got lost on the way to the set of Deal or No Deal. 600, 525, 575, and the last person wants to bid 560. Arrgh! This is why I didn't make it as a part-time math teacher. And if that joke did not land for you, just call CBS immediately and request your audience tickets. You'll fit in just fine. 
Once we get a winner on the item up for bids, probably the person who bid a dollar after everyone overbid the first time, that person stumbles up onto the stage to play a pricing game, which could win them a fabulous prize. It might also win them a dinette set. These games could be anything. You hope that Genie Bob lets you play Plinko, but you could also end up playing putt-putt golf, skee-ball, tic-tac-toe, punching a wall, unlocking a giant safe, writing a big check like you won a golf tournament, or trying to keep a yodeling mountain climber from falling off a cliff. Outside of tossing ping-pong balls into buckets, that was the Bozo Show training a future generation of college drinking gamers, you could end up doing just about any activity that is otherwise normally reserved for an eight-year-old's birthday party. Or you might just get asked which of two random four-digit numbers was the price of a hot tub. You just never know. No matter how badly your pricing game went, you're still not done, as you get to come back and spin the big wheel. Then the winners, who may have picked up 11 grand along the way, go bid on the showcases, another giant pile of prizes, probably including a jukebox that's going to be pretty hard to fit into your luggage to fly back to Nebraska. Somebody goes winner, winner, chicken dinner and collects these prizes, along with a 1099. And then we finish it up with Bob closing out the episode with his famous catchphrase, you ain't never had a friend like me, and we all come back and do it again tomorrow, as long as you can figure out how to stay home from school one more time. I've said it before, but oftentimes you hear that if you want to be happy, you should stop listening to the news. On this show, the adage remains, if you want to be well-informed, you should stop listening to the news. But since this is our last go-round, we're going to give it one final try, even with a couple bonus headlines. Bears sue Goldilocks. Tell Judge $100 million in damages would be just right. Schroeder wins Van Cliburn piano competition. Hufflepuff Quidditch team facing relegation after 15th straight loss. And in breaking news coming to us straight from Sesame Street, Oscar goes green, moves into eco-friendly recycling bin. The green movement has a new on-brand spokesperson, and we're not talking about Kermit the Frog. The landscape is changing on Sesame Street, as longtime resident Oscar the Grouch announced he's ditching the trash can and moving into a new recycling bin. Mr. the Grouch has spent nearly 55 years in the same dented can, which is apparently large enough for a piano and a pet elephant. But now the New York native is moving on up, replacing the can with a giant rectangular recycling bin with scram written on the side. According to Oscar, he doesn't really care about recycling, but picked the bin after discovering it comes with all his favorite grouch bells and whistles. That includes a crack in one of the handles, plus some heavy sludge in the corners where a previous owner tossed in an apple cider jug upside down. He also pointed out that nobody should be expecting him to sort his cans from his cardboard anytime soon. Oscar is the latest in a string of local residents rumored to be looking into new lodging. A wide load truck recently rolled down Sesame Street to deliver a 14-foot-tall house to Big Bird, and that guy with the blue head was seen entering 123 Bank to inquire about interest rates on, quote, Anything not close to a restaurant where Grover works. One last show means one last ad, and fortunately for us, the famous Dr. Rick from Progressive, or someone close, is here to help you out. Here at Progressive, we're committed to helping young fairy tale characters who are becoming their parents. Maleficent put a curse on our daughter if she touches the spinning wheel on her birthday, so we should get her one for a gift, right? Come on, Aurora, let's get you back on the Ambien. We know these characters are just trying to help. They've already forgotten how many times their moronic parents nearly killed them. And let's not even talk about romance. Sure, bud, she can spend the night. Just let me stack those mattresses and get some vegetables. Let's leave the peas in the fridge. Your son needs a princess, not a chiropractic patient. Characters with step-parents can be especially challenging. Remember, we don't do walks in the woods, and they're already throwing down rocks. Progressive can't keep characters from becoming their parents, but we can save them money on wolf bite and poisoned apple palsies when they bundle with us. Pinocchio, put the wood carving tools down, please.
back here on Not Your Mother's Goose, where we're emptying out the news drawer, and the rest of our info is straight out of our Disney Bureau. Disney scraps Old Yeller attraction after guests complain about having to shoot Old Yeller at the end. Ariel still getting her sea legs at Girls on the Run. Disney park goers line up to buy new baby clothes from Country Bear Jimboree. And again, straight from the parks, Epcot's France Pavilion invades England. Tensions are high in the corner of Epcot this morning as armed chefs from the France Pavilion launched a shocking invasion of neighboring England. Equipped with nothing more than four baguettes and a mime, General Gusteau's troops began crossing the famed clogged-up-with-people-taking-pictures bridge between the countries overnight. As reports come in, France is already rumored to have seized control of four red telephone booths and a gift shop selling tea. It's unclear exactly what France hopes to gain through the invasion, since no self-respecting Parisian would ever be caught dead eating fish and chips. Some believe the French are simply feeling their oats after watching their man Lafayette and Hamilton a few too many times, and decided a theme park would be the ideal location to put their military might to the test. Disney boardwalk guests currently vacationing from the U.S. Naval War College are monitoring the conflict, hoping for a resolution before their lightning lane to ride test track opens at 11 a.m. Speaking anonymously, one analyst forecast a stunning reversal in New Alliance, speculating that a joint French and English force could overrun the Canada Pavilion and secure dining reservations at La Cellier in under 45 minutes. Three Blind and Other Mice From the Department of Things I Just Realized, 50 episodes into this, there are a lot of mice in fairy tales. I'm not sure how I didn't notice this before, because we're not just talking about Mickey and Minnie, and I don't need to bring Remy the Rat in either. Think about it for a second. We've got the mice doing Cinderella's tailoring work. We've got Timothy coaching Dumbo. We've got that schnocker Dormouse in Alice's Tea Party, which I realize isn't really a mouse, but it's a lot closer to a mouse than a door, so close enough. And that's just the start. We still have the world's most boring fairy tale, the town mouse and the country mouse. We're not even wandering out to things like Tom and Jerry, Speedy Gonzalez, Stuart Little, and the field mice getting bopped on the head by Little Bunny Foo Foo. Frankly, there are more mice out here than there were under my kitchen sink last winter, and that's saying something. Most of the time, these mice fare pretty well in their stories, other than maybe the mouse that has to run back down the clock in Hickory Dickory Dock, which I still think sounds like some sort of slang term for a urologist. These mice are all winners, but there's one big exception, and that is what happened to the three blind mice, or more accurately, the three blind mice with no more tails, thanks to a run-in with Mrs. Farmer. Other than getting their song played every time a crew of basketball refs botches a call, These mice definitely got the short straw. That being said, we do have to acknowledge that their problem is somewhat self-inflicted. If they knew a nursery rhyme was in the works, it was pretty stupid of them to run after something that rhymed with knife. When you run after the farmer's wife and there's another line left, that is not going to end well for you. You'd be far smarter, especially if money is your thing, to run after, say, a pile of mold or a spinning watery thicket especially if it's Powerball night, if you get my drift. As we hit this final episode, I thought we ought to do one more movie before and after to wrap things up. Dating all the way back to The Empire Strikes Back to the Future... I think I've had as much fun writing this segment as any part of the show. Before we do one final flick, I thought I'd run through a few of the stories that didn't make the cut. Sometimes I had a title and no plot, sometimes I just hadn't seen the underlying movie, though come to think of it, I actually wrote the Moulin Rouge version without having seen either Moulin or the real Moulin Rouge. Unclear how obvious that may have been to everyone who was listening. Anyway, other shows under consideration included The Lion King and I, about a widowed lioness teacher who moves to the Pride Lands to tutor Simba, or Knives Inside Out, where Benoit Blanc somehow ends up inside Riley's brain to solve a mystery. Doesn't seem a whole lot less plausible than the setting used in Glass Onion, as far as I'm concerned. 
I thought about there's something about Mary Poppins as well as While You Were Sleeping Beauty, at least until I realized that the latter of those two just is Sleeping Beauty with a few extra scenes at the end. We could have tried My Fair Lady and the Tramp, The Muffin Man of La Mancha, or maybe Peter Peter Pumpkin Eater and the Wolf, if you're a video game type, I did consider having Link climb a tall tower in The Legend of Rapunzel, and I also came very close to taking a shot at The Godfather 3, Little Pigs, where a porker named Michael ascends to the head of the Hambino crime family by hiring a hitman wolf to off his brothers after blowing down their houses. But at the end of the day, since this is our last show, we need to finish with dessert, and that means it's time for the gingerbread men in black. Our story gets underway with Tommy Lee Jones and Will Smith in a New York City kitchen, baking up some delectable treats just in time for the holidays. Of course, they don't use a normal oven, they just blast their desserts with a flash of light from a handheld stick, and voila, done. Also, no memory of being beaten by a whisk. Except not this time, for no sooner than zap, and a gingerbread man hops off the cookie sheet, runs out the door, and uses a frosting-based bazooka to rob a dry cleaners that may or may not have been selling plasma stunners from behind one of those giant ironing machines. Recognizing that any kind of walking, talking gingerbread man must be an alien, agents K and J spring into action and give chase. They start interviewing their network of undercover extraterrestrial visitors, including a talking horse, cow, and a chicken. All of them report the same thing, a speedy dessert, with a lot of attitude, saying, run, run as fast as you can, want the galaxy, it's on Orion's belt, man. The men in black continue their pursuit, leading them to a climactic rendezvous at the Hudson River. Unable to find a cab and lacking a phone to summon an Uber, the gingerbread man has no choice but to look for an animal-based ride across the way. Of course, this is city life, so we'll swap out the fox for a giant rat offering guaranteed safe passage through a sewer pipe. Seeing the black suits closing in, the gingerbread man grabs onto a tail and heads for Jersey. Alas, moments later, as the agents race through the sludge, the rat lives up to his name, turning into the villain and gobbling down the gingerbread man in three bites. Of course, though, this is not the end of the story. For it turns out that the gingerbread man's name was Orion, and what appeared to be a belt of frosting on his design was actually an entire spiral galaxy. And guess who just ate that? Rather than bring out the flashy thing, the men in black just turn around and leave, knowing that the rat is now destined to grow into a human-sized singing mutant, which, of course, is how we got Chuck E. Cheese. Old King Cole in the world of Merry Souls, there is one and only one contender, the king of Merry Old Souls himself, Nat King Cole. If we'd ever had a tournament of kings on the show, I don't know if Old King Cole would have been the winner, because you got good King Wenceslas, King Friday the 13th from Mr. Rogers, that king that married the lady who was working with Rumpelstiltskin after locking her in a tower. There's a lot of contenders. But even if he's not number one, Old King Cole is definitely a high seed, and that's despite having a lot of wacky stuff going on in his nursery rhyme. First of all, you just don't hear a lot of dudes being described as merry these days. Happy? Yes. Good-natured. Stoned. We've talked about that third option before. When you consider the king was calling for his pipe and his bowl, you start to wonder if maybe he had a medical card. But I'm more interested today in trying to think of any other previous world leaders who were merry. Churchill? Not merry. Ivan the Terrible? No. I'm not really sure about this one. Maybe Gerald Ford was merry. I wasn't born yet. Also, if we assume that there wasn't anything wacky going on in his pipe, then what I want to know is, what's going on with the bowl? You've got a pipe to smoke, you're hauling in some fiddle music, so you need a bowl of what? Like, fruit? I really don't know what goes with fiddle music. Chips? Those come in a bag. Potato salad? Maybe it's a different kind of bowl. Maybe it's his porcelain bowl. Perhaps old King Cole just wanted to sit on the throne while he listened to The Devil Goes Down to Georgia on that fiddle. Bring a magazine, then you'll definitely be merry.
All right, enough of that nonsense. If you're still tuned in, it's for only one reason, and that's to hear our new Rapunzel's Jukebox tune from Andrew Mitchell. I was planning on just introducing it myself, but Andrew volunteered to come back for a quick behind-the-music-style discussion, and let me tell you, it's worth it because his work on this song is out of this world. So let's cue it up. Here's our interview with Andrew Mitchell. Andrew Mitchell returns. This was unexpected after I tortured you through a lengthy Behind the Music episode. But if you thought that was torture, you didn't know what was coming when you opened up that American Pie file that actually has been sitting around for about two years. Andrew, I am just blown away by what you've done. If you never want to listen to Don McLean's music again, I will understand that as well. But tell us a little bit about this monstrous undertaking and what you've come up with for us on our finale. Well, Topher, a couple of weeks ago, you wished me luck. And I jokingly said, I'm going to need it. But I actually did need that luck. <laughs> and also some uh, a lot of tea with honey in it while I was singing, trying to get through that eight and a half minute monster. It's the culmination of the, the arc of the songs that we've done here, where we started with the 50 ways to say goodbye, which incorporates all of these characters into one song. So it felt natural to uh, end with another song where we bring all the characters back on stage together for a grand finale. It's been really great uh, getting deep into Don McLean's head. I don't know what kind of music school he went to where he learned how to sing like that with those rhythms. And, uh, <laughs> but it's, it's uh, incredibly idiosyncratic and he is a one of a kind. And I think if you're only going to have, you know, one monster hit, it might as well be a big monster song like that one. Sure. Well, you know, you, you talk about what a monstrosity that song is. I had thought the same thing that you just mentioned, that this could be a great bookend for the, the back end of the show after how we started. Something that I never realized about American Pie is that every verse is just a little bit different. The syncopations, the rhythms, the accents. I tried to record a little demo for you, and I'm like, oh boy, this is going to be hard. And I had to merge kind of your, your demo, which had the rhythms right, with Don McLean's version, which had the melody right. Yeah, which had then the notes. <laughs> my own written notes on the, on the lyrics about you know, how the phrasing is on each individual line, and then trying to meld the, the melody from Don McLean to your fairy tale lyrics. You know, and I think we've advanced the mythology of this song a little bit, because now people have another set of lyrics to do their own allegorical interpretations on. Right. Who is the lady in a shoe? I think it's Bob Dylan, right? Yeah, I think it is. I think it's all Bob Dylan, actually. Right. Well, I think if you've enjoyed the other songs so far, you're going to really enjoy this one because it does connect a lot of the pieces together. So buckle up, you know, get yourself a, a cup of coffee or, a, you know, a comfortable chair to sit in and, uh, you know, just kind of enjoy the song. On a personal note, I just want to say thank you so much to everybody who's listened to the show and supported us over the years. Uh, it really means a lot to me, as I know it does to you too, Topher. Just really appreciate everyone's support and sticking with us for, for this long. I never yeah. thought a couple of years ago that we would still be doing this here in 2020. For sure. We, we got a couple of, of notes recently that I've passed along to you that I think have been very gratifying for both of us to see that, hey, somebody actually likes this other than just the two of us. Thank you, Andrew, so much. Uh, this has been quite a ride that we've been through. Here it is one last time on Rapunzel's Jukebox on Not Your Mother's Goose, the fairy tale version of American Pie. A long, long time ago, I can still remember how those stories used to make me smile. And I knew if I had my chance, that I could have a frog romance Or stay like Peter, always juvenile But now the details make me quiver With every plot hole they deliver Lots of these decisions Are due for some revisions A mattress seems an awkward guide When you're Picking out your princess bride But why not put a pea inside In case this lady lied Oh, I, I think these writers were high When on Maury told your story And he said that's a lie Guess that mother goose was pounding Rita's and limes 
Writing fairy tales and nursery rhymes Fairy tales and nursery rhymes If you are a prince in love Then you'll have to climb the hair above If Rapunzel tells you so And can you believe this old King Cole Can fiddlers save your merry soul And can a tortoise win a race real slow Well we know that Belle's in love with him Though that beast could really use a trim The lady in a shoe Where the kids don't know what to do Woo! I was a lonely teenage ugly duck But I grew into a swan and that don't suck But most of your lives have run amok Cause you're in nursery rhymes I started singing I, I think these writers were high When on Maury told your story And he said that's a lie That a up boy was pounding readers and limes Writing fairy tales and nursery rhymes Fairy tales and nursery rhymes Now the red hen does it on her own I won't help go make your bread alone But Wait up, won't you share with me? When Aurora came to the king and queen With a curse that strike her at sixteen And a wheel that makes you fall asleep Oh, and after Jack came climbing down He chopped that beanstalk to the ground The giant, he got burned Adams were returned as the lady guessed a bunch of names and found out that it wasn't James as Rumpelstiltskin played his games. They're weird, these nursery rhymes. We were singing, I, I think these writers were high when on Maury told your story and he said that's a lie. Those brothers grim were pounding readers and lives, writing fairy tales and nursery rhymes. Fairy tales and nursery rhymes. Humpty Dumpty tumbled on his rumpty, the crew, it just couldn't fix that lumpty. Eight feet high and falling fast, a spider creeping through the grass. Upon a tuffet it soon did pass Where Miss Muffet found her breakfast Not a blast Well, the big bad wolf's one hungry dude Since pigs and grandmas both are food Emperor can strut and prance Oh, but he ain't got any pants Oh, as the sheep they wandered in the field Bo oh, Peep, you know her eyes were peeled Leave them alone, they'll be revealed It's in the nursery rhyme We started singing I, I think these writers were high When on Maury told your story And he said that's a lie Those Disney folks were pounding readers and lives Writing fairy tales and nursery rhymes Fairy tales and nursery rhymes. Whoa, Horner spreading the bean guy's back. Why is everybody here named Jack? Is anyone a Joe or Ben? So come on, Jack, be nimble. Jack, be quick. Did not jack up that line of lick, cause that's already what old Don had penned. Oh, and as I watched him telling lies, his nose, it did increase in size. Well, Jill went up the hill, the brother took a spill. And as the prince danced on into the night, then freaked at Cinderella's flight, you know. Shoes will find your girl all right, and then you'll have a bride. 
she was singing I, I think these writers were high When on Maury told your story and he said that's a lie Hans Christian A was pounding readers and limes Writing fairy tales and nursery rhymes Fairy tales and nursery rhymes I met a girl who burgled bears And she ate their food and broke their chairs When they came back she ran away She made a deal and went ashore But she left behind her vocal cords So I hope Prince Eric liked to play charades And on his high cold Hansel screamed the birds ate up all his crumbs, it seemed. But once that witch was cooking, for home those two went booking. And the three gruff billies in my notes, the bridge, the troll, and the holy goats, they tripped and trapped and shared their quotes from tales and nursery rhymes. And they were singing. I, I think these writers were high When on Maury told your story And he said that's a lie That Charles Perrault was pounding readers and limes Writing fairy tales and nursery rhymes Fairy tales and nursery rhymes they were singing I, I think these writers were high When on Maury told your story And he said that's a lie That Mother Goose was pounding readers and limes Writing fairy tales and nursery rhymes it's the fairy tale version of American Pie, the capstone masterpiece from Andrew Mitchell, who some way, somehow, made it all brilliantly come together. Find yourself another eight minutes and go play it again. With that, we have officially run out of credits on Rapunzel's Jukebox, but if you head up to the cash register and get some more quarters, you can subscribe to the Not Your Mother's Goose YouTube channel and see what else Andrew and I may have up our sleeves in the future. We've got seven or eight more songs already written, and I just had a couple new ideas this week, so we will try to keep you entertained into the future. That's youtube.com slash the at sign, not your mother's goose. That's where you want to go. And that, believe it or not, brings us to the end. I have been putting off recording this last clip for the show. It's going to be very weird not being on full-time red alert for little red hen jokes, but I never would have thought we'd make it to 50 shows in the first place. I sincerely hope you've gotten a smile or two out of all this silliness, whether you've listened to half a show or all 50. I can't begin to thank everyone who has contributed to the effort along the way, but I do want to try, and I'll start with acknowledging the folks at Dart Frog Books who first made the suggestion that the content from the Not Your Mother's Goose book might work in a show format and got this thing rolling. Thank you to each and every person that I recruited, cajoled, duped, whatever, into recording something for the show along the way. Almost nobody turned me down, which is either remarkable or maybe concerning. And some folks like Brian Weifrich, Cousin Trish and the other Goggin cousins, Cousin Derek Barker, Matt Ottinger, John Johnson, Jay LaFoon, Adam Vibber, Tony D'Amico, Ben Smith, Clark Ramsey, Ben Chaffee, the McBride family, my high school English teachers, Mrs. Coyman and Mrs. Darrow, and surely many others kicked in multiple times to contribute to the show. Thanks also to our original Villains panel and the other appearances that Downstream folks made. They will remain anonymous, mainly to protect Dr. C's reputation for wondering who Claude Rollo might be. Also, thank you to Herb Leibacher from WorldofWalt.com for his support of all of our tournaments. Give him a follow online for some great Disney content. I'm actually working on a new vacation countdown calendar with Herb that will come out hopefully this summer. So if that sounds interesting to you, be sure to check it out. Then finally, of course, the biggest thank you of all goes to Andrew Mitchell, who surely had no idea what he was getting himself into when I emailed him back on August 1st, 2020, asking if he would like to do, and I looked this up, quote, a song or two. Wow. All I can say, Andrew, is we have come a long ways from singing Golden Guys tunes into a Walkman with Ian Tate on the high notes back in the fall of 1999. 
If you've stuck it out all the way to the end, thank you one more time for listening. I am easily amused and frankly would write this stuff just to entertain myself, but it's extremely gratifying when you find out that someone else has enjoyed something that you wrote. As I said, I hope that somewhere along the way, one of these shows brightened up your day or made you chuckle or giggle. And do stay tuned, both on YouTube, Facebook, and NotYourMother'sGoose.com. There will be more fun stuff to come, maybe an update to the original book with some new material from the show. We'll see, no promises. But on that note, I am Topher Goggin, and now we are really setting the goose loose. Thanks for being a part of it with us here on Not Your Mother's Goose. Goose.